I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. You're listening to a DM podcast. Welcome to The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. As an author, ad man and theologian, I've always been interested in people's stories. Not just those with a high profile, but people from all walks of life, regardless of fame. Which is why I created this show. Each guest who takes the Five of My Life challenge chooses a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. It's amazing what you can learn when discussing someone's five choices. I hope you enjoy listening to the show as much as I enjoy making it. In 1977, Stephanie Darrick co-founded the independent feminist publishing house The Women's Press from her home in London. The Women's Press went on to become the largest feminist publisher in the English language during the key period of the second wave of the women's liberation movement. An author herself, Stephanie has written over 20 best-selling fiction and non-fiction titles. Beyond books, she has contributed to Australia's literary and media culture for many years through, amongst other things, her Inner Life column in the Sydney Morning Herald and in her role as a presenter on Radio National's Life Matters programme. Also an interfaith minister, Stephanie has led a spiritually inclusive congregation in Sydney since 2006. So Stephanie, welcome to Five of My Life. Nigel, it's a treat to be here. I have been looking forward to this for ages. Uh, but before we get into your choices, I yes. want to start by congratulating you on your latest book. I mean, you, you keep on writing. You've written hundreds of books. But your latest book is a absolute knockout. Um, it is in shops now, is it? Uh, yeah, it's just out. And, you know, I haven't actually had a brand new book out for for a while. Alan and Unwin did a new edition of Intimacy and Solitude, which is my sort of classic book, uh, for COVID because clearly loneliness and isolation and a sense of disconnection, which are big themes that I've written about for a long time, was particularly strong when COVID was at its height and people were physically isolated and then recognised a kind of inner isolation also, so I, I updated the book for that. But Your Name is Not Anxious, which is my new book, is actually a kind of return to my roots in a sense, because for quite a while, I think, as you know, I'd been moving more towards writing around the very deep issues of meaning and purpose and what we might call spirituality in the in the in the most authentic sense of that but this book was provoked for me by recognizing not just that anxiety is pervasive in this time which is hardly surprising given the times we live in but also that there was not the synthesis of the physiological with the psychological and what you might call existential, you know, why am I alive? Does my life have any meaning? But also neuroscience has given us so much. You know, in the years that I've been writing, neuroscience should have transformed our vision of the world, and yet it hasn't really seeped into enough psychology. So all of that came together for me And then the old thing of wanting to make the book as accessible as possible. So Your Name is Not Anxious is a provocative title. And I I like sharing that with you, Nigel, because you you were an advertising man who really knows how much words count. 
So your name is not anxious is meant to say something about identity, which has also been a big theme for me. It is a sensational book. I, I read an early draft of it and just knocked me out. And I think it is a wonderful to buy for yourself, but also to buy for any friend who you think might uh, need help uh, in, in that area. So good on you. Wonderful. You write such accessible usable books rather than than sort of uh, I think sometimes people can either get frothy or they can get too academic and you walk yes. a very fine line um, yes. and, and so yeehaw but we aren't here to talk about your latest book although it is sensational thank you we're Nigel. here to talk about your choices oh and, thank you yeah. <laughs> thank you and before we get into your choices I need to ask you how do you define the process of choosing oh look I used I used instinct I'm a great believer that inspiration and instinct work together. So you planted the ideas of, you know, these, these five areas. I found it terribly exciting. Uh, there's one or two which we'll come to where I was, I was sort of so spoilt for choice that it made a difference. But with several of them, it was almost immediate, like an instinct. That's the one, that's the one. And I found that really interesting. So I'm quite excited well, so I've got a, a, a secret that might embarrass you. Uh, so because I do this show and I've been doing this show for a number of years, I get repeatedly asked, um, you know, when are you going to do your five? Nigel? Yes, yes. Uh, um, yes and, and could I please be the interviewer for your five? <laughs> well, well I, I, I actually, I'd love you to be, yes. but especially given what I'm about to say. So I'm not allowed, well, we've decided I'm not allowed to reveal it because we'll do it, we'll save it for a special occasion. Yes. You know, a week before my death or the thousandth episode or whatever <laughs> yeah. else. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, so I'm not, I get asked in interviews and yes. things and I'm not allowed to say. But when it comes to my possession, yes. when and if I do my five yes. in my life, yeah. one of the things that I might choose and think I will choose is something that you gave me 20 years ago. Oh, my goodness. And me. you won't remember that you gave it to me. No, I don't. And it's remember. been on my desk every single day since. Oh, there you go. Gosh. So I'm going to show you. I'm now showing Stephanie a peace stone that she gave oh, me 20 years ago. Oh, my goodness. Putting it on the table. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember it well now. Now that I see it. There you go. Oh, how touching that is. It's, it's amazing. I, I, that has been every single day for the last yeah. two decades. That's been at my writing desk. And I, it I, I reminds me of you and lots oh. of, I mean, I imbue that with meaning about lots of resolutions I've made in my own life. Yes. But there you go. Yes. And I will also say that at the time that I gave that to you, I'm remembering that your life was extremely demanding, very hectic in a, in a profession where superficiality was everything, I'm sorry to say, but it was. And that, that, I mean, the superficiality had to be very clever and well-informed and on your toes and highly competitive. But all of that was so stressful. And I gave you that little stone that says peace. Oh, gosh, that was a message from my heart to yours. Oh, well, listen, you're, you're, you're making me well up. So there yeah. you go. 20 yeah. years ago, I've been carrying that. Thank but you. again, it's not about my choices or my books. It's about you. And we're moving on to your first choice on Five My Life. Yes. And it start, we always start with a film. And we're going back to 2002. And I'm really glad that mm -hmm. you chose it because it made me rewatch it. And I mm -hmm. enjoyed it all over again. Uh, and you have chosen Whale Rider. Yes. Could you tell us uh, on Five My Life why you have chosen that? Yes. Well, I watched it again after I gave it to you as my choice, and I was kind of stunned with how appropriate it was. I chose it because uh, Whale Rider is a New Zealand movie. It's set on the east coast of the North Island, uh, somewhere near Gisborne, for people who want a little bit of uh, geographical positioning. Um, and it came from a novel uh, 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 written by a New Zealand Maori writer called Witihimaira. And it happens that as a little child, my sister and I lived with our parents in that area and each of our parents had a one-teacher school. Um, and so we, my, my older sister and I went to our mother's school and we had the incredible life of living like Maori kids, which has really m meant something to me and has resonated throughout my life. So it was partly that that I saw that 
choice as a kind of positioning of my the beginning of my story. I didn't know I would be speaking about the film at the beginning. That experience, and then later we lived in Western Samoa, as it was called then, now called Samoa, where my parents both taught at Samoa College. So I had the in- incredible uh, privilege of living with two different Polynesian cultures as a young child, and that was very, very formative for me. However, when I watched the movie again, there were so many themes in it. There was the theme of Koro, the grandfather, who is unable to recognize the amazing strength of this young girl, Paikia, she's called, whose birth was marked by tragedy because her mother dies in in childbirth and the twin brother who was supposed to be in the lineage of the chiefs has also died. So it's a it's a remarkable movie and I, I do recommend it to anybody who is listening and wants to catch up on it. It's remarkable because it shows the mix of cultures and it shows the mix of expectations between an old man who older man who is desperate for the tradition and the culture to survive, but who has to also move with the time and the courage of this young girl, but also the interconnectedness between people and nature. Uh, For me, it was just profound. And there was also a a lot of chanting, calling, and that calling is in my bones. When I hear that Maori calling... uh, Ah, oh, it goes to the deepest, deepest places within me. And it was also a story of illumination that we, if we can open ourselves up to the inevitability of change, then we experience illumination. And I, I guess that's one of the themes of my writing. I thought the, the young girl, yeah. the, I mean, uh, astonishing performance. Astonishing. And she, she was the youngest person ever to be nominated for an Oscar yes. at the time. I think there's yes. been someone since who was younger. But, um, but can I ask, when did you when did you move from New Zealand? Oh, I left New Zealand when I was uh, 20, three months after my 20th birthday, and I haven't lived there since. Right. Over the last 20 years or so, I've returned to New Zealand quite often, uh, mainly to lead spiritual retreats and teach and talk about books and so on and so on. Excellent. Well, moving on to the second choice, uh, and I'm also very grateful for you having chosen this one, because to my shame, I hadn't heard of the author, John O'Donoghue. Uh, you chose Divine Beauty, uh, published a year after Whale Writer. Such a sort of substantial book book I, I, yes. I, I, I I've got my copy here and I've got pages and pages of notes yes. and dog-eared things yes. uh, tell us about divine beauty Stephanie well I need to tell you about John O'Donoghue himself first before I talk about divine beauty John O'Donoghue is it was was an Irish poet and philosopher who had also been a priest and left the priesthood but really became a kind of wisdom priest for us all, you know, outside the institution. And he died very suddenly in his 50s, which was a huge, huge loss. Because what he taps into very much from a Celtic viewpoint, and the whole thing of Celtic spirituality is of interest to me, Dalric, my surname means bearer of water. John O'Donoghue, using that kind of magic of the Celtic where where nothing is quite as it seems and that there's always a world that we're just not quite recognizing. It's not on the other side of the veil. It's here, but do we have eyes to see it? And so what he's wanting to do in a very realistic, compassionate way is opening us up to the depth of life. In fact, he would go so far as to say, and he says it very clearly in Divine Beauty, that without opening to this depth of life, we are hardly living. And it doesn't mean the divine beauty is something that every culture seeks. And he talks about it in terms of our relationship to nature also, so differently from Whale Rider. And if we are disconnected both from our own depths or we're disconnected from the natural world around us, 
no matter how surrounded by people we are, we will have a kind of existential loneliness that we will try to fill, obviously, with, you know, sensation or material things or addictions or there will be an agitation and a restlessness in us if we don't come to this place. So it's not a kind of add-on. It's a fundamental. And John O'Donoghue's manner of expression is so poetic that it takes us away from linear thinking and this is very, very important. I, I'm sure you experienced that as you read it. He uses the word threshold a lot. And we are constantly moving across these thresholds between the imagined and the unimaginable, between the desperate and perhaps the little bit hopeful, and the grief-stricken and yet the laughter, the overwhelming sadness and yet the hope. And he does this in such a, a real and true way. There's not a note of sentimentality here, is there? No, and, and there's something uh, – reviews on books sometimes are, are a little bit sickly and they, yeah. they don't ring true. But the review on the copy that I've got uh, yes. is from the Sunday Times. Yes. And it says, O'Donoghue stops us in our tracks, yes. reminding us that we might be alive for reasons other than than productivity or consumption. Yes. And you go, wow. So yes. the person who wrote that quote, you go, brilliant, because that is what this book does. Yes. You put it down yes. and you think. And can I read a, a, a quote to you from it? Yes, I, please I, I've do. got so many uh, dog, dog-eared do. chapters. But, um, oh, it's just absolutely fabulous. So th- there's a quote here that I have marked, which is, more often than not, we feel so enmeshed in the life we have that the prospect of change appears remote or yes. impossible. Thus, we continue on the tracks that we have laid down for ourselves. We are unable to think in new ways, and we gradually teach ourselves to forget the other horizons. We unlearn desire. Quietly over time, we succumb to the dependable script of the expected life and become masters of the middle way. We avoid extremes, and after a while, we no longer even notice the pathways off to the side and no longer sense the danger and disturbance that could be experienced out there. We learn to fit our chosen world with alarming precision and regularity. Often it takes a huge crisis or trauma to crack the dead shell that has grown ever more solid around us yes i mean wow yes well, i mean wow i mean and, and you sort of read that and you think mate th- th- this is really thoughtful profound stuff I and mean, in some of the work that i do i talk about people not making proper deep decisions about their life until one of the big four happens death mm-hmm. disease divorce mm-hmm. redundancy mm-hmm. and i would love to ask you your opinion on how you get people to, to properly reflect, I don't mean in a woo-woo and um, mm. shanty way, but mm. to actually think about what's the point. You know, we, I've got 30 summers left before I'm pushing up daisies. Yes. Y- you know, to actually think about it, it's not about, you know, buying a new car or renovating the kitchen or whatever. Mm. You know, why are we here, for Christ's sake? Um, but how can you get people or yourself to do that without the jolt, the trauma that O'Donoghue, yes. you, you go, oh, my gosh, one of my loved ones has been yes. diagnosed with something awful or I've had an accident, and then you you reassess your life. But how do you do that yeah. or encourage other people to do without being preachy or worthy? How do you persuade people? Well, there has to be a certain kind of readiness within a person. And unfortunately, many, many people cut themselves off from it. A kind of, any kind of readiness out of fear, I think, or out of conditioning that tells them that that place is not for them, that place of self-inquiry is not for them, or they trivialize it by thinking of it as some kind of self-obsession, which it's the quite opposite. Because in fact, when we have dared to ask some of these deeper questions of ourselves, We can afford to be so much more open to other people. We can afford to be open to other people without even a lot of words. We can use instinct and inspiration for our own benefit, but also for the benefit of others. So what we're really talking about is waking up all of our all of the aspects of our inner life, including our own sensuality. And that's what um, 
John O'Donoghue writes about very much and also about passion. And I think in my own book, Seeking the Sacred, I wrote about that very, very strongly. And I also made it clear, as John O'Donoghue does in Divine Beauty, we're not necessarily talking about the, the very big events, but we have trigger moments in which something is made clearer for us if we are available to it. John O'Donoghue in Divine Beauty talks about a moment in which he returned home to his parents' house and the house where he grew up. And he looked into his father's eyes and he recognized, knew somehow that death was coming nearer. And within weeks, his father had in fact, you know, left his physical body and had died. How did he know that? It wasn't that he's a, you know, psychic or something, but he was tuned. And and I think we we can tune ourselves more into life or out of life. Um, what I'm saying, I hope, doesn't sound too, uh, too difficult. It's more a matter of surrendering than of growing. It's a matter of surrendering some of our conditioned ideas and allowing ourselves to be more present to what is. Um, and the way that I've tried to persuade people in my books, and I think O'Donoghue does this too brilliantly, is just to tell stories. Yeah. To tell stories about a moment in which perception changed. That's what helps us most. Abstractions can leave us cold. Stories make it vivid. So I'm going to tell you a tiny story, if I may. Please. Which is, I, I, I know that you know I've been a peace activist most of my life. And when I was about 14, I remember this moment very, very well. I was standing in my paternal grandmother's house, a modest house in a town in New Zealand called Fielding. And she was telling me about her husband, my grandfather, who died when I was just a very little girl, whom I didn't remember. And this was not so long after the after the war, you know, 15 years or so after, 20 years after. But still, it was vivid, the Second World War. And she was telling me that in the First World War, her husband, my grandfather, had refused to fight but worked on the hospital ships. This was for me an absolute epiphany moment. I had instinctively felt that war is wrong, that it's an insult to our human consciousness as well as the most dangerous thing that we can do to one another, but also that he had exercised a choice. And that was for me a profound moment. And I think that if we look back on our lives, every one of us, you know, those who are listening, and certainly I, you're nodding, Nigel, we'll just know there were those epiphany moments. And, and that's what O'Donoghue is asking us to look out for. And also to, to gain the comfort and the excitement of being passionate about living, passionate about life. I can't move on from your second choice uh, without asking you a question about your, not just your storytelling, which is wonderful, but you enabling other people to tell stories via your incredible track record of setting up the women's press. When, when I'm explaining about you to some people, I, 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 I default to recency. So I'll, I'll talk about yeah, your wonderful yeah. books and, and yeah, yeah. Your interfaith ministry yeah. and things. And, and I can reference you yes. and not mention yes. one of the most remarkable things that yes. you have done. So I, I, I was really quite keen to ask you just to talk briefly yeah. about the Women's Press, because that was the most one of the most significant feminist yeah. publishers yes. on the planet. It was. And you set it up. Thank you. Yes, it was. And I, I do the same thing too. And I think that's in part because... Uh, it seems to people a long time ago, but in fact, the effect of it was very long lasting. And one of the most exciting things that we did, the Women's Press was set up with, with a backer and a few other women, but working out of my house in the East End of London, it, we became a remarkable press, actually. I can say that with distance uh, and without any sort of ego, 
we became a remarkable press in several areas. And one of the key areas was that we published when, you know, New York publishers were not doing it, London publishers were not doing it, publishers elsewhere were not doing it. We published books by women of colour, including we had Alice Walker and we published The Colour Purple, which was probably one of our most famous, but also remarkable multicultural women. So, you know, the word intersectionality hadn't even been born, but what it meant was that at the Women's Press, we bravely and boldly and, and passionately put together these big questions, not only around gender, not only around sexuality, but of course that, but also about race, about social class, about what it does to people, about who's entitled and who isn't and who can have an opinion and who may not have an opinion. And here we are, you know, in the year of the voice. So that was a, a, an incredible opportunity an incredible opportunity that I made the most of. And it was also very, very hard. I mean, I'd had a remarkable publishing career even before the Women's Press. And I have to say to people from the age of 22 on or so, partly because I had been working since I, I'd been working in financially independent since I was 16. So when I started working in publishing at 22, I was ahead of my British colleagues in the sense that I knew what it was to be bored and I knew what it was to feel so unfulfilled. And when I started working as a publisher, I, I felt truly, its I know it's a cliche, oh, I've come home. So I worked like crazy and I was more uh, flamboyantly ambitious than girls were supposed to be <laughs> and all of that. Yeah. Uh, but it also... It also produced something in the end that was quite marvellous and eventually I had to leave it because I had this inner call to write. Yeah. One of the writers that you published, I mean, alongside Andrea Dworkin, I think I'm the oh, only. Andrea Dworkin, I, I think I'm the only yeah. man in the world who's read Intercourse. But oh, I, but right. I, I, yes. I, but you also published um, Alice Munro. Oh, and, we did. And a complete bizarre coincidence. I was in her bookshop in Victoria. Last week, did, did you know she said it's an incredible place called Munro's Book? It's it's, it's no. famous in Canada, and no. it's in a beautiful building. Right. And, and anyway, so we published Lives of Girls and Women. Actually, I think that was one of our first books that yes. we published in the late seventies. Yeah. Oh, look, it was a, it was an incredible time. Phyllis Chesler, Liza Altha, so many wonderful, wonderful women, and we also published a very good book in our own hands, which was a. a absolute groundbreaker of a book about self-therapy and I referenced that in my own mind when I wrote my new book right. um, Your Name Is Not Anxious because one of the things that we were very keen to do at the Women's Press and that I'm still keen to do is to say professional knowledge or research does not need to be held only by the professionals. Some of it is immensely useful for people who can put it into their, into practice right now without paying to see somebody, or they may pay to see somebody, but they're not with that person 24-7. So the kind of democratization of ideas, if I can use that rather awkward phrase, you know, ideas belong to all of us. Look, I guess that's one of the most important things that I feel, that great wisdoms, that great ideas yeah, and that nobody should feel shut out from accessing them. And and uh, it's interesting that I mean, I, I don't want to get on a patriarchy bandwagon, but the there have been sways of history where there have yes. been gatekeepers, oh, gatekeepers. Who, who wouldn't let. So it's an amazing that you yeah. gave you gave a voice to some incredible artists and thinkers yes. and writers who otherwise yes. wouldn't have been able to be published. So oh, that's that's exactly yeah. right. And and we did a lot of work around. Uh, visual art too. So we did a lot of work around e economics and we did a lot of work around environment. But it's not just the patriarchy. It's a kind of, I don't know, it's the, the word gatekeeper is a very, is a very apt one. Uh, there are all sorts of conscious and unconscious acts of gatekeeping that shut people out and social class is one of them. Yeah. Oh,
choices stephanie yes uh, they have been just open doors to me uh, and the the next one i'm slightly embarrassed to talk about this because uh, every choice on five my life gets put on a uh, spotify playlist every music choice so yes. spiegel and spiegel by arvo pert i think it's pronounced 1978 Now, I sat down, as I do, obviously, with, with yes. all my guests, and uh, I listened to uh, yes. that track. And, and I have, I'm lucky enough, I'm touching wood as I say this, not to have any extraordinary sorrow in my life. I, I, yeah. I've got just an average amount, but nothing to complain yeah. about. Yeah. Um, and I found myself uh, weeping, listening yes to this yeah. song and, and sort of ugly crying. I mean, in my study alone. But I was also sort of quite happy at the same time as I was crying. It moved me yes. so intensely. Ten yes. minutes of this beautiful, sort of repetitive, yes. gentle... Anyway, so Spiegel M. Spiegel is your song choice on Five My Life. Yes. Uh, thank you for choosing it. Could you please tell us about that? Yes. Well, music was the hardest choice for me uh, to make because there is so much music that I absolutely love and so much music that I've used in my teaching. I use music a lot in my teaching because music takes us past words. And Spiegel im Spiegel means mirror in the mirror, which is a process of reflection. And of course, reflection is what I'm constantly inviting people to do in order that our actions can be more voluntary, more more alive, more more wanted. Not that we shouldn't lose spontaneity. In fact, let's have more spontaneity, even if it means we make complete fools of ourselves. Let's have more spontaneity. But Spiegel im Spiegel is a very, very simple piece, uncluttered, that just lets us go. It lets us surrender in some way, and I've already used that word today. The, the word surrender, we hold on to so much, don't we? Modern life asks us to hold on to so much, to do so much, to be so much. Spiegel im Spiegel, the mirror in the mirror, invites us just to let go and to be. And that's what you felt. You felt the sadness, but you were not out of touch also with your happiness. I think that in some ways that's perfection. Well, it, well, it made me, I, I couldn't help, it made me think about my parents passing. Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want any special sympathy, but it, but it brought up yes. deep, proper things. It, it made me think about the love for my children. Yes. And, and you know, this is just a piece of bloody music. And so I, I'm, I'm sat down because you chose it to listen to it. Yes. And you could have chosen bebop, punk or, or blues, but you chose that. So I listened to it. I wasn't I didn't go into my study to deeply reflect about yep. the most important things in my life. Yes. Yet there I was two yes. and a half minutes later yeah. thinking about. Yes. The most important things in my life. Yes. That, you know, the, the profoundity of paradox, you know, some yep. of the, the saddest and some of the most joyous yes. at the same time was this yes. beautiful cello was just dry. Yeah. I mean to, to perform it yes holy moly what what a responsibility because yes. th th it's so sparse it's that you, so you sparse. can't you can't mess it up because no. it would be noticed and it would have to be played not just with technique but with soul that I think that's what is true of all of these choices that I've made, they bring us to a place of soul, which is not necessarily a religious concept of all, but it's a word that allows us to think about who we are in the deepest way, not just in terms of our roles. And Spiegel im Spiegel is a, a kind of portal, a, a door opening without words. I shouldn't laugh, but it, it, in retrospect, it made me laugh. I mean, I watched it 10 or 11 times on, on YouTube, but one of the 
uh, clips I watch, there's a lady sitting behind the pianist who has mm. one job, which is about eight minutes in to turn the page of the sheet music. Yes. But you can see as the minutes are tipping by that her lip is quivering. Yes. <laughs> and oh, the, yes. Poor, the poor woman is having to sit behind the pianist and she's just, you know, she's there. She can't yeah. do anything else. So she, yeah. by the time she turns the page, she's crying. Yes. Yeah. But it will be a crying of, in a sense, of relief. Uh, not, not, not a crying of desperation, but a crying of relief. Uh, well, you know, again, we, we hold so much tension in our poor old bodies and somehow letting that go. And, you know, Whale Rider, Divine Beauty, Spiegel im Spiegel, they're all about letting go and being. And, and yes, this is a very, very difficult world that we live in, you know, which I, I clearly address, I think, bravely and boldly. But we're not here just to suffer. And we can bear our suffering better when we allow ourselves moments of peace. And also connection to place, which brings me on to your oh, yes. fourth choice. Now, you've chosen. I love this. People respond to this choice in, in a whole multitude of ways. I, I have uh-huh. the, the fabulous writer Nancy Klein chose in the middle of a sentence. Lane Beachley chose the ocean. Yes. Uh, and you've chosen Australia. So can you explain for us what, what you mean by Australia? Because you, you might mean yes. the, the land, you might mean the concept, you might mean something different or, or a combination. So could you explain what you mean by it and why you've chosen it? Well, it was a difficult choice to make uh, in the sense that, you know, I thought of all sorts of beautiful places that I've known and loved and so on and so on. And, uh, you know, my first choice of whale rider was very much about place. But my relationship to Australia is quite ambiguous. For example, uh, I've been doing quite a lot of work with a with a colleague in the States, and I'm often called an Australian writer. And I don't really feel that I am an Australian writer, but I'm certainly not a New Zealand writer either. And although I lived those 16 years in Europe, mainly in England, but also in Germany, you know, I, I have no claim on being European. And I'm remembering that Virginia Woolf had this amazing words to say, which were, as a woman, I have no country. As a woman, my country is the whole world. So it's partly that, but it's also that, you know, I feel like Australia is a land of such possibility and such profound ancient knowledge that has been crushed to an extent by colonialism and by the pervasiveness of a kind of colonial mindset that should not exist in the times that we live in but still does, a kind of assumption that the uh, First Nations cultures, indigenous cultures, were somehow almost lucky to have invasion and uh, the complete change of possession. And I actually, funnily enough, we're going to talk about possession as the last thing. And this very notion of possession is actually quite a fraught one. So I came to Australia thinking that I would be here only a a year or two. I was pregnant with my first child. And then the dollar massively devalued against the pound. It was the 80s. And for a whole lot of reasons, didn't go back to London, though I had absolutely assumed I would. So there were so many changes in my life all at once. Uh, and I was struggling to you know, make a living as a freelancer. And then I became the chair of the women's press. So I was moving back and forwards a bit. And I had two children a year and a half apart or less. You know, So it was a crazy time in, in many ways. And I don't think I've really, I don't think my feet really touched the ground here for a long time. But in more recent years, and my children, I I must emphasize this, my children are thoroughly, unconditionally, you know, wholeheartedly and never think about itly Australian. Although their father is English, but he I haven't lived with him since they were young, so that's a long time ago. But what's made a huge difference for me is that in the last, oh, I don't know, 
15 years or so, I have spent increasing amounts of time understanding the First Nations cultures and really grasping what an honour it is to live with these cultures that are the oldest surviving cultures in our world. And I've had a couple of experiences. One was that I interviewed Miriam Rose Ungermeer Bauman, who was the Senior Australian of the Year a year or two ago, and I interviewed her for the Sydney Morning Herald and went to Daly River to sit with her. But I've also, uh, in relatively recent years, married a paediatrician who lives in the Northern Territory and works there and who has been an advocate for Indigenous and refugee children's health, but particularly Indigenous children's health for many years. And we also have a First Nations member of our own family. So that I, I regard all of that as a great privilege that I've come to see those aspects of, of the depth of Australian culture uh, much more vividly than many people have access to. But that has also increased my frustration uh, that so much is done in Australia that does not support that view of the world or view of, the, of First Nations or view of the environment and so on and so on. When I first spent time in Sydney, where I lived exclusively for a very, very long time, what I adored was the outbursts of nature in this global city. You must feel that too. I know you live near a beach, you know, that you would be walking around and squashing, you know, frangipani under your feet or something. I, I love the exuberance of nature. But Sydney has also become a tough city to live in, harsh and unaffordable for many people. And, you know, I'm, I look, I'm a humanitarian activist, so I feel some of that and, you know, the homelessness and so on. So am I an Australian writer? I don't know. Am I a global writer? That sounds pretentious. And yet it's closer to what I am. And I think that we need to let go of some of the kind of adherence that we can easily have to nationalism. You know, I grew up in a country, New Zealand, which had such a tiny population then that we had no claim to importance in the world whatsoever and how liberating that was. So I think we need to be very careful of, about the line between loving the place that we live and being supportive of what's best about it and speaking up about what doesn't serve it well, being unafraid, but also not being overwhelmed by, you know, we are the best. Uh, that's not an aspect of identity that I think serves any of us well. Uh, you know, on a spiritual side, we live in a state of interbeing. You know, the Vietnamese peace teacher Thich Nhat Hanh teaches us very strongly that we are interdependent and so we are. And physics tells us this too. Science tells us this. But spirituality tells us this most of all. We depend on one another. That's the very nature of so-called indigenous spirituality, that we have to depend on one another. We have to protect the environment so that the environment can protect us. How wise, how thrilling, how liberating that is. And Australia could be embracing that with so much more vigour. It's fascinating hearing you talk, Stephanie, because I, I love the way you describe Australia uh, and use the word possibilities, because I, I, I view it as as a country and a concept that is bursting with possibilities. Yes. And, and, and uh, y you know, without claiming to know things I, you know, I'm not an expert in, you get you... You wouldn't be human to think every now and then that we aren't living up to the potential. Yes. But isn't it amazing that there is that potential? You go oh, as a country. It's you, wondrous. It was just fantastic. Yes. Um, moving on yes. to your fifth and final choice, which yes. is often my favourite choice on Five of My Life. Ah. Uh, I'm looking at it now next to the, the peace stone that you gave me on the table. Uh, it is an enamelled cigarette box that belongs to your mother. It's a beautiful piece. Um, could you please describe it for our listeners and tell us why you chose it on Five mm -hmm. My Life? I mean, the idea that it's a cigarette box, forget that. It's an, <laughs> it's a, but it, it was, and they must have had quite small cigarettes. It's an enameled box with very vivid colours 
and uh, small horses racing across it. Um, and because it's enameled, the colors shine uh, and it's it's bruised in parts. It's got little um, breaks in the enamel and so on and so on. But the reason that I love it so much is that my mother died when I was eight years old, which has been a defining experience of my life. And the older I have got, the more I grieve for her losses as well as for my own, that she was in her 30s and did, did not get to experience so much more life. And she was a she was a remarkable person. I, I know most people think their own mother was remarkable, but for her time, she was very re- remarkable. She was well-educated. She had a university degree. She t- she loved teaching. Uh, I've already spoken about her, her, her teaching life. But she also was very artistic and, and progressive. And I remember being mortified going to school with brown bread sandwiches. <laughs> and I remember being mortified that she would um, use uh, half a cut garlic to do around the wooden salad bowl instead of using mayonnaise as everybody did those <laughs> days with chopped lettuce and no, 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 my mother was quite way ahead of her time and it kind of breaks my heart that we would have been such good companions had she lived and not left her life uh, so early she had cancer and it was a terrible, terrible experience but the whole question of being mothered and mothering is the kind of central plank of my life. Not having been mothered nearly long enough, she, I was only six when she became ill, but also I was the same age virtually when I became a mother that she was when she died. And that has also been incredible in my life. I mean, it doesn't sit on your CV with the same sort of prominence. But I truly think that as ambitious as I was, as as fortunate as I was in terms of opportunity and making the most of them and so on and so on, my children have grounded me. I used to think that not having a mother on one side and being prematurely independent you know, and and completely independent from when I was 16. Had I not had the children on the other side, I I don't know if I would have just lived a life that was too much in the mind. And so I found it very challenging to be a mother in the sense that it activated a lot of my anxiety. And I, I reflect on that in this new book, uh, in that I I became concerned about taking enough care of them, or I don't mean enough care, I took incredible care, but that something would happen to me and they would be left without a mother. This, you know, was obviously a kind of PTSD. And I did have quite severe illness when they were still children and so on and so on. So that's the sort of shadow side. But the positive side um, is that This little box, this little enameled box, uh, reminds me also that we can bring, again, notes of beauty and of of originality. And that was something that I tried very much to give my children. They're both actually pretty artistic and creative people, although they wouldn't describe themselves like that. But, you know, to be fresh in their living – I think that's the greatest thing. And my children are also very loving parents. So I think that lineage of love is what I'm really talking about when I show you this little box and that somehow it's survived for me to have. And sometimes I have little pink crystal hearts in it uh, as a kind of, again, a kind of lineage thing. So... On the one hand, I'm incredibly unlucky to have been a woman who grew up without her mother being present. On the other hand, I'm an incredibly lucky woman who knew what it was to be loved and who's made it her professional work as well as her private desire. I don't know if desire is quite the thing. um, To be as loving as I can 
also to my own children and to encourage others. To I think that's the theme, to encourage others that in the end, it's the atmosphere of loving kindness that is most healing for any of us. I mean, other things do matter, safety and so on. And, you know, being able to put food on the table, those things matter greatly. But the atmosphere, the presence, the invitation, it is the primary quality of the soul. I think it was O'Donoghue who, who said that we all live in a burning building and the only thing that we should salvage is love. Yeah. Yeah. W- wonderful. Thank you for sharing that that story. What a, what a beautiful Beautiful object. Where do you keep it, may I ask? Oh, I keep it on the dressing table in my, you know, chest of drawers. Right. And the chest of drawers that I have in my bedroom came with me from England. It's an old Victorian. It looks unremarkable, but it came with me from England to Australia. And it that sits on it and, you know, a couple of photos of, of course, of my family. Yeah. yeah. There's one final question. On oh. Five My Life. It's the traditional trick question that is no longer a trick question because we've done 150 episodes. Who would you like to hear on Five My Life next and why? You know, I would actually like to hear you talk to my husband. His name is Paul Bowett and he is an unsung hero. Well, he's actually been sung a few times too. <laughs> you know, he's done the most remarkable work in the most sincere and authentic way, as I said earlier, not just for Indigenous children. And we need to remember that in Australia, it's only Indigenous children that have diseases of poverty, um, and also for refugee children. He was... He was um, instrumental in getting kids off Nauru, for example. And I think it's that goodwill without making a big fuss about it that absolutely drew us together. And also, he's very funny, Uh, you know, Irish Catholic descent. And uh, I I think he would be of great interest to your listeners. Well, I'm going to lean on you for a strong recommendation. Because, Thank you. Because we follow up everyone that is nominated. Um, so I'm going to put that ball in your court. Uh, Stephanie Derek, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories uh, around your choices on Five My Life. Thank you, Nigel. And I do want to say that one of your qualities is generosity. It's a soul quality that you express without effort. It's just who you are. And in these years of knowing you, you have always been so generous in supporting other people. And I see this five of my life also as a kind of generosity that you're sharing other people's ideas and thoughts and life experiences with a wider world. So so here's to generosity, Nigel. Oh, that's very sweet of you to say. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you follow Five of My Life, you might enjoy my latest book, Smart, Stupid and 60. In it, I write about a number of the issues discussed on the show. It's the 20-year follow-on from my first book, Fat, Forty and Fired. If you have any feedback on the book or suggestions for the show, please get in touch via my website, nigelmarsh.com.